We're now going to consider rotational inertia, which is also known as the moment of inertia, and it's written with the symbol capital I. The moment of inertia of a body relates to how hard it is to start the body spinning. So how much torque we have to apply to get it to start turning. So when you think about it intuitively, you know that if we have two masses, which are quite far from a pivot point, like in this case here, it's a little harder to get it to spin than if we move the masses closer to the center. In this case, I can apply less torque, which is the turning force, in order to get it turning. So to come up with an expression for I, the moment of inertia, we're going to consider the kinetic energy of a body as it rotates. So let's just slide these back along. Let's consider this body here. We've got two masses. Let's assume to make it simple that this bar is massless and that it's rotating like this. Now, from what we've learned before, we know that because this is absolutely symmetric, the center of mass is right in the middle. So as I turn it, that center of mass is not moving. So while this is rotating like this, it has no translational kinetic energy. But it's incorrect to say that it has absolutely no kinetic energy at all because parts of it are moving. These two masses on the end are moving. So they must have some form of kinetic energy. So the type of kinetic energy that they have is known as rotational kinetic energy. So if I want it to have translational kinetic energy, then I actually have to move it through space like this. But while it's just stationary, it has only the rotational kinetic energy. Okay, so let's look at how we can calculate the size of this kinetic energy. So let's consider just one mass here. Let's call this one mass one, and on the other end we have mass two. At the moment I'm rotating it about the center, but I don't necessarily have to. So let's call the distance from the pivot point to mass one, R1, and the distance from the pivot point to mass two, R2. So the pivot point is the point about which I am turning it. So when it's turned, then mass one here has kinetic energy given by a half mass one times the speed of mass one squared. But it's moving in a circle, so we know that V is equal to omega R, and in this case we've got V1, and it's at radius R1. And so we can say, well, the kinetic energy of mass one is given by a half M omega R1 all squared. And so that's equal to a half m1 r1 squared times omega squared. Now for mass 2, it's rotating at the same rate because they're all connected to this one body which is all rotating at the same rate. So by rotating at the same rate, we mean they've got the same omega. So omega is the same for everything attached to this body. So the kinetic energy for our second mass, mass 2, is given by a half m2 r2 squared times omega squared. And so the total kinetic energy as it rotates, assuming that my bar is massless, is given by a half m1 r1 squared omega squared plus a half m2 r2 squared omega squared. So we can write this as a half times m1 r1 squared plus m2 r2 squared times omega squared. Now, if we imagined having lots of separate masses along my bar, then as I rotate it, they all rotate at the same rate. So they've all got the same omega. And we could say, well, that the total kinetic energy is equal to a half times the sum over all the masses of the mi, which is the, the mass that a particular mass has, times ri squared, the distance of that particular mass from the pivot point, or times omega squared. Now, previously we've been looking at the analogy between translational quantities and rotational quantities. So for the translational case, we know that the translational kinetic energy is given by a half mv squared. And here for the rotational case, we've got that our rotational kinetic energy is given by a half times the sum over i, mi, ri squared, times omega squared. 
And we know that the e angular equivalent of the velocity is the angular velocity, omega. And so it suggests that that sum is something special and is equivalent to the mass. So that sum is in fact our moment of inertia. So we can say, well, the moment of inertia i is equal to the sum of mi ri squared summed over all the little masses involved. So that's what our moment of inertia is. Now let's at this point assume that our rod is no longer massless. If we wanted to work out the moment of inertia of this rod as we pivoted it about one end, say, what we'd need to do was sum up the contribution of each of the little points along the rod. And so when we do that, we're going from a sum into an integral, because an integral is just a sum where we break it into really small components. So for continuous bodies, we can say the moment of inertia is given by the integral of r squared dm, which is equivalent to our sum over i of mi times ri squared.